at some point, we, when people grow up with neural links embedded in their head, they'll have plenty of time through adolescence and all that kind of stuff to develop really specific neural modules in their brain that are designed to talk to this interface. If you can get the language in and out directly via Neuralink, maybe you can write a novel in 10 minutes. <laughs> Reality isn't what we think it is, so that you can just hear radio waves, right? So that you can hear the Bluetooth, you can hear the Wi-Fi, you can, you can hear the television channels, you you know, you can hear the Starlink when you're outside walking your hand, you know, like whatever you focus your attention on, you just hear that stuff, right? Planning for a clinic, that's not something you do if you think, yeah, maybe we'll get to market in 10 years. I was impressed. That stuff left me with a different impression of Neuralink than I had after the first show. And the plans for the Transdura implantation, well, that is brilliant. Like it's a big win. My biggest single takeaway from the 2022 show and tell was that they're they're building, they're going for scale. They're not timidly tinkering around with this, trying to see what the possibilities are. They've decided this is going to work. My guess right now is AI is moving too fast and Neuralink won't catch it, but it could happen a lot fast, you know, because it's Elon time. <laughs> so show and tell was I looked at this and I'm like, wow, they're moving really fast. Like they're so much faster basic stuff in two years and decent stuff in five years and amazing stuff in 10 years. Like that could happen. And that would be great if it does. The beautiful thing about the neocortex is it's completely abstract in general. Like it's an incredibly powerful learning machine. My computer on my desk, it doesn't want to watch. It doesn't want to download anime. <laughs> it downloads anime <laughs> because I tell it to, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't care if I go to Twitter or Facebook or if I read, a, or if I read a book. For me, the AI risk mitigation aspect of Neuralink, I think is, like I said, the cherry on top. There are all these other things. There are so many other great things that it will enable, not the least of which is like in the near term, it's almost dead certain to be a fix for, you know, this paraplegia. We just know that's going to work. It's worth doing it if nothing else, it, just for that, if nothing else. You know, they spent a lot of time talking about upgrades, <laughs> right? And upgrades, like that's going to be a deal. In some situations, all you have to do is turn up the voltage, right? And you can overcome the insulation. But sometimes you you just can't do that. Neuralink is in a space right now where like there, there's so much, there's fruit laying on the ground and they are just running around <laughs> picking it up. It'll be quite a long time before they've picked up the stuff that's laying on the ground, much less ha have to start reaching up to branches to get it because it's just such an unexplored space. It's a process and they're early in the process right now, but I guarantee you there's an insane amount of runway ahead of them. They can go down that runway and the performance is just going to get way better. The craziest things that you can imagine I can imagine some pretty crazy things. My guess right now is AI is moving too fast and Neuralink won't catch it. Um, mm. So I'm, you know, do I think it's worth doing? It's totally worth doing. Neuralink is worth doing for all kinds of reasons that, are, that have nothing to do with AI alignment. Uh, so I, I think it should be done, but, uh, and it's not useless. And I can see why it's an inspiration and it could turn out to the development of, of Neuralink. It could go much faster than I'm, sort of imagining because most of my expectations for how fast the technology are going to progress are from my experience over the last, you know, decades of watching this back when, I, when I was in my twenties, I, I developed, I designed a brain interface, uh, non-invasive brain interface amplifiers. Right. And we did medical equipment, you know, I mean, we had to go through that whole process of like developing a medical device and whatnot and looking at that bureaucracy and how slow that thing is like, that's what my expectation is based on, but it could happen a lot faster, you know, because it's Elon time. <laughs> so, and I hope <laughs> yeah, exactly. it will. that was one of the things that, that I really got from the last uh, show and tell was I looked at this and I'm like, wow, they're moving really fast. Like they're so much faster than my, you know, experience. Like maybe, maybe we could see basic stuff in two years and decent stuff in five years and amazing stuff in 10 years, like that could happen. And that would be great if it does. And it, if it does happen on that kind of time frame, then, then maybe it does play a role in the whole, you know, keeping the demon bottled up. Well, so this whole like AI risk seems like it, there's, there's actually two types of risk. One is like the, the AI models become, uh, decoupled or or uh not in line with what humans are wanting but then there's also like another uh issue with ai which is like it could just be merely a tool that becomes so powerful that a bad actor wants to use yeah. and then uses that against somebody so really yeah. the ai go ahead and that's the most people who think proximally, like they think about like, what are the threats over the next 10 years? Those are the threats they're most worried about right now. 
is like, this is like, you know, biological weapons, or this is like, you know, nuclear weapons uh, in that, you know, it's an incredibly powerful tool in the short run. And it's not so much that it's going to go berserk and we're going to have a robot uprising as that, you know, if the technology is used by, I'll say bad actors, because you can have good actors in the, you, you can have people who use these things for the best of intention and you still end up with a dystopia. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So Elon talks about this tertiary brain layer where mm -hmm. we currently have our cortex and then limbic system and then Neuralink could be a tertiary letter. Uh, can you explain what he means by that and, and elaborate on what you think uh, the future is going to look like if they're able to make it that tertiary brain layer? Yeah, that's a, I actually, I think the tertiary brain layer is a great metaphor for trying to understand the potential for what Neuralink can do. Uh, you know, like, how do we think about the capabilities that it brings to an augmented human who's using it as a tertiary brain layer? So this tertiary brain layer concept is not really applicable in the short run for people who are trying to say, regain use of their limbs or move a cursor around on the screen. This is the, this is a, this is a, a metaphor you can use for talking about like what the long-term plan is like, what is it adding to healthy people at a point where people are voluntarily adding this? So, you know, in, in brain development, this the brain is often kind of described like an onion, right? The oldest parts of our brain evol in evolutionary terms are kind of like in the middle and then layers kind of got added to that. So as animal skulls get bigger, you know, the way that evolution would add to the brain is it would add more layers to the outside of the brain. And uh, so with the advent of mammals, there was a thing called, uh, there was, a, we, we got a cerebral cortex uh, which is mostly a structure that is called the neocortex. I'm mostly going to say neocortex is most of the cerebral cortex is neocortex and neocortex is interesting because of a particular, because of particular traits it has. So the, uh, the neocortex in particular, it's super flexible. In, in fact, an interesting characteristic of the, the neocortex, like if you were, if you take a neocortex out of, if you can take it out of a human brain, disconnect it from all the white matter underneath it and you lay it out, it's like, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a sheet that's a, you know, two to four millimeters thick and it's about the size of a dinner napkin, right? It's like 18 inches on a side or something like that. It's roughly the, the area of the thing. And it's just a sheet of tissue. Now, when you look at, when you look inside a human skull, you know, the reason that you see all these folds is because it's wadded up and stuffed in your skull, right? <laughs> so you've got this, you know, but it's a flat sheet of material. And if you look at the structure of that flat sheet of material, what you find is it's this, I'll say hexagonal array of mini columns. Like there's this structure, this repeating structure that just repeats all the way through it. So in evolutionary development, it's a really easy thing for evolution to come up with because it, you know, evolution comes up with this idea for this repeating subunit. And then your brain just makes a zillion of them. Like they're just carbon copies of each other, you know, makes this sheet, stuffs it in your head, and then your nerves all connect, you know, sort of distributed on the other side of the thing. And then neocortex learns whatever it needs to learn to do whatever you need to do. Right. Which is, that's a very abstract and general way of describing what the neocortex does. But the beautiful thing about the neocortex is it's completely abstract in general. Like it's an incredibly powerful learning machine. And it's just like this repeating, you know, subunit that's repeated all throughout the neocortex. Okay. It's kind of like a computer, right? Uh, you know, computers, they're arrays of RAM, arrays of SRAM, arrays of bits. Um, and the, you know, the algorithms that we run on them, just they're, they're built out of these simple building blocks and you just, you build a lot of building blocks and you get this, this super impressive behavior. And because it's reprogrammable and the neocortex is totally reprogrammable. This is one of its strengths. It can just learn a new skill or it can add to a skill that it, that, that it knows. Now, the older part of the brain is, is different from that. The older part of the brain took much longer to develop. And it's much closer to, you know, an analog microwave oven or a television or something like that. Like it's, it's built the purpose. You don't, pro, you don't program it. So you have these two things. Mammals have these two things in their head. We have this part of our brain that, that, that we've had for as long as the brains have been around. Um, 
that does all the the basic housekeeping of keeping us alive. You know, it makes uh, it makes you know it talks your 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 heart and your lungs talk to it, and you know it makes you hungry. It regulates your body temperature, like all of the super basic simple control stuff. It's basically got. So why do we? Why, what was the point of a neocortex? Well, a neocortex is basically what makes you smart. Right. It gives you this flexibility where you can go out and learn stuff and you can learn really fast stuff. Right. So all of the all of the all, it, it's almost like there's there's the human and then there's an the animal. Right. Like inside your body, like you're a human being, but your body's an animal and you cohabit your body with this animal. Right. And the animal has all its needs and, and all this stuff that it does, you know, but you're you know, you're in this body with it, using it to be your actor in the world, the animal itself. And so the old brain is kind of the animal part of it. And the neocortex, that's kind of the human part of it, right? Although, and Elon, you know, he points this out that like all of your desires, they come from your old, the older part of your brain, not your neocortex. Your neocortex really is, it's kind of like a computer, right? Like my computer on my desk, it doesn't want to watch. It doesn't want to download anime. <laughs> it downloads anime mm -hmm. because I tell it to, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't care if I go to Twitter or Facebook or if I read a, or if I read a book or watch CNBC, like I want to do things and it does my bidding. Right. And that's the relationship that your neocortex has to the older part of your brain. Your older part of your brain wants stuff and your neocortex is a tool that the old part of your brain uses to get what it wants out of the world. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. Like in, in most of the, you know, aspects of things that we would consider intellectual, that's all your neocortex, right? You're like the old part of your brain is just, it's like this brute it just wants things, right? I mean, in certain ways, you know, it's, it's a brute that, that evolved over a billion years and it's got a lot of common sense about what it takes to get along in the world. Right. So I don't want to completely dismiss it. It's got a lot of value, but it's not flexible. It's not super adaptable. Right. It's like an alligator. Right. And it is kind of like an alligator, like the what an alligator has in a brain, like the whole part of the alligator's brain. That's kind of like what the old part of the human brain is like. Right. So, OK, so now we've got this model it, and, you know, and Elon rightly points out like, you know, nobody wants to get rid of their limbic system, say that's what he's referring to as the old brain. And nobody wants to get rid of their neocortex, right? I mean, you want to you want to enjoy Thanksgiving dinner, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but, you know, you also don't want to be an idiot, <laughs> right? You know, and it's right. like if you want to enjoy Thanksgiving dinner, you need a limbic system. If you want to enjoy anything, you need a limbic system. Because, you know, a computer doesn't enjoy anything. It doesn't have any of that stuff built into the algorithms that, you know, that it's running. It's a tool that a human uses. And the neocortex is a tool that the old part of your brain uses to get what it wants out of stuff. Okay, so if we add to the brain, and we're going to add a thing that's even more like a neocortex than a neocortex is. It's even more programmable. It's got even more because your neocortex has so much I.O. compared to the rest of your brain. Like its I.O. rate is just phenomenal. Like your vision goes into your neocortex, right? Doesn't go into the old part of your brain. You're, you know, or it's like in mammal brains, vision just goes straight into the neocortex and it does all of the processing. That goes uh, that goes into that kind of stuff. Although the the visual cortex is kind of a slightly different part of the neocortex. It has a slightly different structure, but to a first approximation, you know, it's it's like everything else. It is a, the visual cortex is a little bit specialized, but it's the only part of the neocortex that has significant amount of specialization to it. Um. So, so if you add a machine, another layer on top of this, you kind of do to the neocortex what the neocortex did to the old brain, right? Which is mm -hmm. you give the neocortex an even more powerful tool for processing information, for accessing the outside world, right? It's even more flexible and it's got unlimited capacity because it doesn't have to fit in your head. The problem, the, bit, the limitation on human intelligence is we have to fit our skull. We have to hit our, fit our brain inside our skull, right? And you probably know that that uh, skull size is the limiter on, it's been the, the uh, uh, evolutionarily limited uh, in human beings for the last, I don't know, million years or something like that. Like women's pelvises have evolved to be able to 
uh, to have a baby with the largest possible head. Like the head is the constraint. When you're born, your half of you is head, right? Your head's like half your body when you're born, right? Like that's how important it is. And the first five years of your life, when you're growing up, that's almost all brain development. Like you're to you're totally helpless. Like somebody has to take care. Of, certainly for the first couple of years, you're you know. So humans like our gestation period wasn't long enough for our brain to get as big as evolution wanted it to get your head doubles in size, you know, and after, after you're born and that's all, you know, that's all development that goes on, you know, but we can't get any smarter inside this case. What we can do is we can take the lid off and we can connect you to the whole outside world to giant data centers or, you know, whatever other hardware there is out there. And, and now in human intelligence is no longer limited by, the confines of our skull or, you know, the size of our mother's pelvises. So we can, we can move on from that. Um, so, uh, so the tertiary cortex is basically, you can think of it as a lever, you know, the, the neocortex is secondary. The primary thing is the brain, you know, the brain that keeps your heart beating, you know, the brain that where makes you hungry and keeps your body temperature at 98 degrees and that kind of stuff. And then there's another layer on top of that that has all of these other wonderful capabilities. That's a secondary layer. And the tertiary layer is what you get when we when you take the human brain and you plug it into the wider world. Sure. Um, okay, so there's another reason for people to care about what Neuralink is doing. It's to cure brain problems and mm -hmm. uh, central nervous system problems. Yeah. Um, are you excited about that more so than the AI risk mitigation or the other way around? No, definitely. I feel like AI risk mitigation is a cherry on top. Like that's the thing that we might get if the timing works out. Um, and, and if it turns out, I mean, we don't know how AI is going to develop right now. We don't know that the threats, I, I'm actually an AI optimist, like in the spectrum of people who worry about stuff, I think, and, and Elon has made comments along these lines too, that he thinks, you know, that AI going bad is like a 1% probability. And I, I would generally agree with that. I don't think AI is likely to go bad. I think it's unlikely to go bad in the same way that I feel like we are unlikely to get hit by a comment. But, you know, you plan for it because the consequences are bad if, you know, if it does happen to go that way. So I think personally, and I've been thinking about this a really long time. We could talk about it for hours if you want to. Uh, I think that AI is very unlikely. And then 99% is probably a good thing. I think AI is 99% likely to develop the way we want it to, to just be a tool that mostly just gets you. I mean, like, you know, you've always, every, every tool, like somebody will do something bad with it. But by and large, I expect it to be, you know, a very substantial improvement to the human condition. You know, I think that's overwhelmingly likely, it, but the probability, the possibility that it goes bad is not zero. And so you definitely want to spend time thinking about it because of the potential consequences. So for me, the AI risk mitigation aspect of Neuralink, I think is, like I said, the cherry on top. There are all these other things that there are so many other great things that it will enable not the least of which is like in the near term, it's almost dead certain to be a fix for, you know, this paraplegia, quadriplegia sort of phenomenon where you've got a significant number of people who have serious brain or spinal cord injuries. Like, you know, that we just know that's going to work, right? And it, it's worth doing it if nothing else, it, just for that, if nothing else. Sure. So kind of this like AI potential risk, although it has a 1% chance, or, or you perceive it to have a 1% chance, uh, that 1% chance is, is a huge issue if that happens. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the brain illnesses and spine problems, like those are definitely 100% they exist and 100% chance that they are solvable yes. uh, given enough time so and enough... Uh, and not even a lot at this point, right? I would say... Sure. You know, I, Neuralink has already demonstrated the core, you know, capabilities for being able to do this. There's the question, I mean, e efficacy has been demonstrated 
right? Like you will be able to provide useful capabilities to these people. Safety needs to be refined and it needs to be proven. And so that is just going to take time, right? And, you know, they've, they've got all this lifetime testing. They have all this biocompatibility testing. They need to refine the surgical procedures. So the surgical procedures really, it's as safe as it possibly can be. Right. And the, 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 you know, they spent a lot of time talking about upgrades, right. And upgrades, like that's going to be a deal. That's, that's going to be a significant issue. Not the least uh, because the, you know, the, the tech that they're working on for the implant right now, it's not the kind of thing that's going to last 50 years. Like even if you put it in somebody, it's going to stop working in five years or something like that. And so you, you know, you need a robust follow on, like, what do you do after five years is up? And they need to figure it out, figure that out, and that's a critical part of the safety aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's work to be done on safety. I feel like for the for the you know the worst the people in the worst case scenarios right now, the efficacy is already sufficient. I mean, you've um, is it the Utah array uh, and the BrainGate stuff, right? They've already demonstrated. You've got utility, right? It just, it needs to be refined so it's safe, it's repeatable, so that the lifetime is long enough that the risk reward, um, you know, the cost benefit of doing it can be improved tremendously and it will be improved tremendously. But, you know, we know the values there. The question is just like, how much value can we get out of it? Can we get a million dollars out of it? Can we get a billion dollars out? You know, like, because the sky's the limit, you can go really high if you, if you get the reward up high enough and you get the risk down low enough, then it does become like LASIK and anybody can get it. And, uh, and there are all kinds of, you know, as it gets safer and as it becomes more capable, more and more, there's so many, you know, there's so many people in the world who have, whose lives could be improved if you could tinker around in there a little bit, <laughs> right? Like we know there's a problem. We kind of know how to solve it, um, but we just don't have access. And so for a lot of people like depression, right, is, is one. I, I mean, depression is, you know, it's a pretty broad spectrum. Of, there are many, many different things that cause depression, but there's a space of things that cause depression, which are addressable by, you know, this kind of implant. And, you know, so it'll be, and depression is a serious problem, right? Not only do lots and lots of people have it, there are lots of people who really suffer from it and where it, it makes it just a massive difference in their ability to live, lead their lives. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally have a decent understanding of how conceptually Neuralink works, uh, but can you explain like just at a very high level, the concepts of like putting the probes next to neurons and, and all of these very simple things to somebody who's never heard of a Utah Ray deep brain simulator or Neuralink. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we've known for a long time, your, your brain is, it, it's neural tissue. It's mostly neurons and glial cells, right? So there's, there's some structural tissue in there that keeps everything in place. And there's, um, there's a vascular network, which delivers, uh, nutrients and oxygen, and it takes away waste and whatnot. But aside from that, most of your brain is just neurons. It's a lot of neurons. A neuron is a cell. It's got a cell body, it has inputs, and it has an output, and it makes a decision. Um, the uh, neural tissue, so neurons are extremely dynamic cells. Um, they, uh, they, are able, if you get a lot of neurons together, they can express a complicated behavior by connecting to other neurons. So like a, a, a single neuron, it's got some inputs and some outputs and does some simple processing. If you take a bunch of neurons and you connect them together and you connect them in the right way, you can get much more sophisticated behaviors. The more neurons you have, the more complex a behavior you can get. And essentially all of the behavior expressed by a human being or a mammal or most, most creatures that have brains, it's there. It's consequences of just the connections, the connections that these neurons make, right? The neuro, neuron, the, the networks of neurons in your brain, they can learn, right? And so that's a thing that that um, that is a really critical characteristic of nerve tissue, right? Nerve tissue has got this adaptive capability. It's got this very high level information processing capability that 
most of the rest of your body doesn't have. I mean, you can talk about whether, you know, gut biomes and that kind of stuff. They have these complicated feedback networks and that kind of stuff. But for the, and your immune system is a fantastically sophisticated information processing system. But most of the behavior you get from, you know, mammals, humans is, is, is nerve tissue. Now, individual neurons, um, this is a cell that has electrical activity. Like it, it, uh, the way that it propagates a signal through it is you is is this, it's essentially electrical. The 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 a neuron sets up a charge difference across its cellular membrane. Um, that charge difference is kind of like stacking dominoes in that you can have an effect, you can have something happen in one part of the cell, and they're they're kind of tree shaped. You know, you've got a cell body. You got like these wires that go out. The input wires are called dendrites, and then you have one, an out, typically one output wire called an axon. And uh, and so the cell body essentially what it does is it collects inputs from these dendrites, makes a decision, it does its processing, and then uh, and then it fires the axon in when its behavior is triggered, right? So and the way these signals tr travel along the wires is they're ele they're electric potential chemical gradients across the cellular membrane, which is kind of stacked like a bunch of dominoes. So you, and the reason that you want to do this is because, uh, is because nerve cells can be quite large and they want to, they want to make a decision at one point and send the result of that to another part of the cell really fast compared to other things. And the mechanism that nerve cells came up with is they trigger this gradient that propagates down one of the, either an axon, either a dend a dendritic, uh, the dendritic tree into the cell or out of the, or out of the, you know, the output goes along the axon. So it's electrical. Like there's rather it's, these aren't like wires in a, in a, in a car where, you know, or a house where you just have a piece of copper, you know, and you put an electrical potential on it and, you know, electrons shift. And so there's like a current running through it, but it is electrical in the sense that, that it's this, it's information transfer, which is mediated by this electropotential across it. So we have this tissue uh, that's made up of, um, you know, 80 billion, 100 billion neurons inside your head. And uh, the information, like what your brain does is essentially the behavior that it expresses is captured in the interconnection between all of these neurons. But the individual neurons, we can externally trigger them we can trigger an input to a neuron or an output to a neuron. And we can tell when they're triggered because we can see this electrical potential propagating along, say, an axon or even at the, or, or even at the neuron body. So uh, the way you stimulate it is if you have a, an electrode, if you embed an electrode in the tissue and it's relatively close to a neuron, if you pull a current through the electrode, you will you'll generate an electric field local to the tip of that. And if the electric field density ex exceeds a threshold, it can trigger an ion channel in a neuron to trick. And then that set of dominoes cascades goes on. So essentially you can run a current into some nerve tissue and can, you can cause a neuron to fire. So when you cause a neuron to fire, all the other neurons that take it as an input get, it, get a signal. And so that signal can cascade on through the brain and it becomes, it's just a signal and you've injected it into the information network. Similarly, when, when a neuron fires, it creates this thing called an ax, action potential. If you've seen the plot, in fact, this is what the Neuralink, uh, the Neuralink logo is, right? It's an action mm -hmm. potential, right? Well, if you look at a particular point on you know, a nerve fiber, and one of those nerve signals propagates along. Well, that's what you see. You see this wave, it propagates down and a probe that is next to that wave, it'll see that action potential shape, you know, as that wave propagates past a certain point. So, the pro so a probe will let you read a signal from a neuron and it'll also let you trigger a neuron, right? And so these are the two things we get. We, we you know, we can monitor neurons and we can trigger neurons. Uh, and so you, essentially a probe is you're, take, you're basically sticking the tip of a small metal wire into the brain tissue. When the way that the probes get installed right now, um, you know, they basically take a wire. Each individual wire has um, 16 probes on it. So it, it's not the, the, you know, a probe that goes into the nerve tissue right now. It's not a single probe. It's actually got 
16 wires embedded in a common insulating sheath. And each one of those wires comes to, essentially, if you look at the tip of the probe, you get these 16 little dots along the edge of it. And each one of them is the terminus of a different wire. So when they put a single probe in, you actually get uh, 16 different, it, with the current probe design, you get 16 different locations where the tip of a wire is protruding into the brain tissue. And at that location, you can monitor the neurons that are in the environment and you can trigger them by pushing a current. Through, you can potentially trigger them. So right now, uh, the thing is brain tissue is so dense that you can just take a probe and you can stick it into the brain tissue and you will be close to a whole bunch of neurons. Now, uh, some, some of the tips will be really close to them. Some of them will be farther away because there is all the structural tissue. There's other tissue in there aside from just neurons. And it's possible when you put it in that you might be close to the axon of a neuron, but not close to the nerve body. You know, I mean, there's different mm. parts of the neuron that you might be close to. And so the characteristics will vary a little bit. And you might be close to two or three neurons. And so what your probe is actually reading is some, some you know, uh, it, you know these, essentially these different signals are interfering at the probe tip. And similarly, when you trigger, uh, when you send a triggering uh, input current into the thing, you might be triggering multiple neurons. But it's a, a characteristic of brain tissue is that neurons, uh, in order to keep the wiring short, functions that are closely related are very closely positioned inside the tissue. So um, right now the probes that get inserted into the brain are, um, they, they go, they, you know, so they're, they're plugging into the neocortex right now in the mammals that they plug into. As we mentioned before, the neocortex is like this, uh, it's the sheet of tissue. It's right at the outside of your brain. So it's really easy to access. And you've got, it's, it's mostly made up of these repeating units that are called mini columns or micro columns, where each one of those is like, um, it, they're, they're functionally very similar. They're all very, very similar. Um, they, once they've got installed and you train the brain up, how they connect will make every mini column unique. But the, the original structure of the, like when you're born, right? They're all about the same. And, uh, they're about the diameter of a probe right now. They're 30 microns or 40 microns wide. That's approximately the width of, and then the, the, you know, they're, they're called columns because they're, like I said, 40 microns wide, but then they go through two, three, four millimeters thick layer. They, every mini column is the full height of the, of the, of the layer of tissue. So when a probe goes in right now, it sticks into a mini column, right? Because that's, because that's what we have. And you've got these, 16, you know, surface things that, that are sort of, they're bumping into uh, different parts of the, of the mini column as they, as it works its way through the tissue. And so uh, when, you know, a particular probe is talking to one or a small number of mini columns where each mini column is kind of a functional unit, right? It's got like a thing it does. And so you mm -hmm. can trigger that mini column to cause it to go and so when it, the other mini columns that it talks to or that depend on it, they, they're like, oh, that guy fired, right? And they take mm -hmm. it as an input and they run with it. Does that answer your question? It does. Uh, I'm going to show a video. The monkey mind pong demonstration back in mm -hmm. 2021 included yeah. this blog post. And then they show the specific area in the cortex that they implanted these electrode threads. And then they they show like exactly where they're corresponding to. Um, so this, uh, like basically Neuralink is building on top of a lot of prior research. Mm -hmm. They're basically doing similar to what the Utah Ray and Deep Brain Stimulator uh, functions were, but then the Utah Ray and Deep Brain Stimulator are not nearly as information dense or or able to provide you with this level of detail as what Neuralink is doing. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them, like a Utah array is, um, it's a, you know, it's a hundred probes. It's a 10 by 10 grid that's fabricated as a single device that gets inserted. It's physically, it's relatively large. So the individual probes are they're separated substantially in space because it's just physically larger. And then they're all fixed. It's a rigid array. So when you put the, 
when you put it in, you know, the probes go in on this grid. And uh, so you, you don't get to avoid vasculature, right? You get one sensor at each one of those points. And they're, they've got to lay exactly on a rectangular grid because it's a, because it's a rigid thing. And I think the probe tips are actually larger too. So, you know, so one advantage of this is, is you can get a lot more probes in. Um, they use a 64 threads with 16, like the current in version that they were showing us in the 2022 show and tell is, um, you know, 16 probes on 64 threads for a total of 1,024 total probe. So like, obviously a thousand is better than a hundred also because the, because the individual probes, um, you know, the robot basically can look at the brain tissue and you can pick better and worse places. So of the probes they put in, more of them are going to be useful because, because you're choosing the most fruitful places to put them. So that's another big advantage over a Utah array. Um, the, the, uh, so another big problem with anytime you introduce anything into the body, the body, you know, depending on the degree of biocompatibility, the body will have a response to it. Like your immune system will respond. Uh, you're, you have a healing system also that, that, you know, it fills in air gaps and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so a probe that you inject into any tissue in your body, your body will have a response to, and the brain is no exception to that. So the brain will form a fibrous isolating sheath around anything that it, that it you know, kind of decides is a foreign object embedded into it. And the problem with once it forms that sheath is that becomes like an insulator, it becomes an obstacle to the probe doing its job. So a not uncommon situation that you have is you stick a probe in the brain and on day one, it works great. But you know, a month later, two, three months later, once the brain's healing response is like it's put an insulating sheath around your probe now. So your probe is still in there, but you know, you're not getting as good a uh, interface to the rest. Like to, uh, in some situations, all you have to do is turn up the voltage, right? And you can overcome the insulation. But sometimes you just can't do that. And because what'll happen as you change that voltage, the shape of the electrical field around the end of the probe and how that affects uh, neighboring neurons will be a thing. So like, ideally you want to put, you want to have a really good connection, what they call low Z or low interface. You don't want it to be a short, but you want a low impedance connection so that when you're, so that you're very sensitive when a nearby neuron fires for the sensing thing. And when you want to trigger a neuron, you can use a very small current. The more current you have to use, the more tissue you're going to activate. So instead of activating one or two or three neurons, you might be activating 500 or something, you know, which it's a much more confusing signal that's harder for the brain to deal with. And then similarly, when you're trying to read stuff, it might be much harder to read a single neuron's behavior, right? So you, so essentially it's just cruder. If you, if the, if the, if the brain doesn't accept it. So as the, you know, biocompatible materials are materials that are less likely to provoke that healing response. I mean, the ideal material, you stick it in the tissue and tissue has no chemical reaction to it at all. Now with an electrical probe, there's some challenge there because you will get electrochemical reactions if you just run electricity into tissue. So it may be that getting perfect uh, acceptance, maybe that won't, maybe that won't happen ever. Um, but th certainly the smaller the object is, because one of the things is your, you know, your immune system, it notices things because it has an immune sensor cell bump into some kind of surface and that triggers a response in that tissue. The smaller the surface of the probe is that you put in, the less likely you are to trigger a response. And so at some level, like if you could make, like if you could get the wire all the way down to like a single molecule of width, you'd be, you know, almost none of them would trigger any response from tissue at all. And so right now they're, actually, I don't know what their current thread diameter is. I know their needles, they said their needles were 40 microns. The thread must be significantly small now. But if your thread is like 10 microns or something, you're getting you're getting really far down. And uh, now if it's 10 microns, it has to be flexible because it's, you know, long, rid long things. <laughs> you can make something out of tungsten, which is an incredibly hard, rigid material. But if you make it 10 microns, you know, if you make it 10 microns wide and, you know, mm -hmm. a half inch long, it's going to be really flexible, <laughs> right? Sure. Because everything is flexible when it has that kind of aspect ratio. So, so that's great. It means on the one hand, you can use almost any material you want. You can even use crystalline materials. As long as you, the bend radius isn't very tight, it can still be a fine wire because it'd be flexible enough if you made it thin enough.
right? It's like they were talking about That's using uh, amorphous silicon carbide as mm -hmm. an insulator, right? I don't know how they're going to deposit it on the wires, but silicon carbide is really hard, yeah. <laughs> right? Sure. Like silicon carbide, it's like diamond, you know, like you silicon carbide drill bits, they like cut through steel like it's butter. It's incredibly stiff and brittle stuff. Yeah, and yet, true. but you can use it as a insulating material on a flexible wire if you make it thin enough, right? Sure. Um, okay, so Elon, Elon talks about how a deep brain stimulator is mm -hmm. kind of like uh, how, like he, he used the metaphor of back in the day, if the TV wasn't working and you had this big box top TV, then you, you could it, just, yeah. yeah, you just smack the yeah, TV. Yeah, and a deep and, brain stimulator is like that, right? <laughs> that, that is kind of what's going on. It, it, I mean, you've got the, uh, like, I'm not an expert in this space, right? My understanding of a deep brain simulator is you've got, you have a, you have a, a, you have a set of neurons that is misbehaving. And so what you do is you smack it to get it to shut up. Right. And then it shuts up for a while. And so the, like the, the, the problem that it's solving is that it is that it's, it's triggering the, this, this set of neurons out of cycle to, to just break the bad behavior, break the cycle of this bad behavior. And I, you know, that's not ideal. It, it would be, you know, obviously you'd like to have a, a better intervention where you just stop, figured out what the root cause was and, uh, and solve that. But, but for people who have problems that are addressed by deep brain simulation, it's way better than nothing. Sure. Uh, and then likewise with the Utah or both, both of them uh, have, like this device protruding out of the head and, mm -hmm. and Neuralink does not, it's wireless. Yeah. And that's like a gigantic leap forward. Yeah. Uh, so does, does, it's like kind of people... amazing that the wireless stuff to, has taken so long to come to that space because, okay. you know, I mean, so this is a thing like you, you need microelectronics both because you need to make it small and you need to get the power requirement down really low if you want to go wireless. And microelectronics, they have to be customized. It's going to be a custom silicon design and that kind of stuff. And building even a single chip can be pretty expensive and pretty complicated. And so my guess is that these, you know, DBS systems and uh, that DBS systems and Utah arrays, they just like the volume has been too low to justify the development. And it's nice that you know, Neuralink basically started with that. I mean, I know they they had some earlier stage stuff where they they built a couple of things that were hardwired and whatnot. But going to custom silicon so that you can go wireless, like, I mean, it, you have to do it. There's you just can't. You, you know, no no reasonable long term therapy is going to have people with like a box glued to their skull and a wire hanging off of it that they have to be tethered to. So I guess one of the things that I've found striking is that with Tesla, like in the early days of Tesla, Elon in his interviews was often talking about how like they're going to be able to get to like batteries that are much denser than current batteries and mm -hmm. um, like the manufacturing of electric vehicles or just vehicles in general will improve over time. But it was never like, or I had never heard him say, like, oh, here's the current state of the art version of what we're working on. And we're going to just 10 X or hundred X easily versus at the end of this 2022 update, when there were questions about like, okay, how does this compare to like a deep brain simulator? Well, the head neurosurgeon, Dr. Matt McDougall was talking about how you're just sticking in this gigantic, uh, pr probe into the brain and Hoping you don't, don't hit really anything know. important. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so Elon's like, hey, this is a really low bar for us to clear. Yeah. And mo moving forward, like they're going to clear it way, way further. Like the goal, I think, is to get to nanoscale uh, th threads and electrodes. Yeah. I mean, a thing that's worth considering when you compare, um, you know, for instance, your battery example is like if you start with a, with a, relatively mature technology that already has a lot of development, you know, it's harder, the, there's not as much low hanging fruit, you know, in terms of things that you can do that will make, you know, radical improvements. Neuralink is in a space right now where like there's so much, there's fruit laying on the ground and they are just running around <laughs> picking it up. 
right? And it'll be it, it'll be quite a long time before they've picked up the stuff that's laying on the ground, much less ha have to start reaching up to branches to get it because it's just such an unexplored space. Yes. So yeah, um, the, the pace of improvement, if you look at the core specs, like the channel count, sensitivity, like they, they didn't spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the, the, the chip itself right now, it's, you know, it's an eight, it's a analog to digital converter. It's a digital to analog converter. It's got one of those on each of the channels. They multiplex. I mean, they don't even, I mean, they've, they've got a set of MUXs. They've got a set of ADCs and DACs that they actually generate the signals with. And then they have some really, really simple onboard electronics that basically, you know, interprets the signals, filters them, you know, tries to look for action potentials or spikes, right? And then log that with some very, with some very simple, uh, um, you know, algorithms uh, to, to sort of extract this stuff. I mean, they're super, super, such early days because like, I guarantee you, like there's layers and layers of better that you could do as these algorithms go, but it's going to take a while to get there. Like, you, you know, you, you, uh, it's a process and they're early in the process right now, but I guarantee you there's an insane amount of runway ahead of them that, that, you know, they can, they can go down that runway and the performance is just going to get way better. And that, that's not even, they're looking at a 16,000 channel. You know, one simple way to just get a lot better is just have a lot more channels. Um, the, the yeah. odds that you're, that you're talking to exactly the right neuron, they get higher, the more neurons you're talking to, um, you know, you get so much more statistics from, from your, uh, so your, I mean, your ability to extract subtle patterns out of neural activity, like the more probes you have, like that, that's just going to get a lot better. And, you know, I, I, I see no reason why they won't get to millions of, of probes. And, and that's probably where it starts getting real, where, um, you know, you don't need, you're not focused on really simple heuristics and algorithms and stuff to get your signals out and to inject signals in, you can start looking at it, you know, in a big data kind of format, going for much more abstract, much more valuable and information dense uh, interfaces to the brain. Like, so right now, just, you know, moving a cursor around on the screen, that's a, it's a, it's a lot to somebody who can't do it, but, but it, you know, what would be a lot better is if you could, you know, express an abstract concept, right. And the neural network outside just takes that, you know, pipes it into a, into a universal mimetic space so that a computer can work on it or it can be handed to another person and you don't even have to explain something to them. They just know, you know, you form the concept in your mind. It gets transferred to an outside thing. You, if you have enough electrodes and you have enough processing, like that's a thing that becomes possible. Okay, uh, I guess I wanted to ask you about like the longest term things that are like the craziest things that you can imagine for what Neuralink could enable in the future are. I can imagine some pretty crazy things, but I'd say like the, the, uh, so here's like, this is a really simple one, but this is the thing that I think you get to at some point, like way down the road, which is, uh, it becomes a way for us to slip our mortal shells and move into another substrate. Another substrate, like so. Uh, we're we're on a biological substrate right now, right? Mm -hmm. You're there in your body, right, with all of its limitations, I/O limitations, like well, immortality, right? You know, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your intellectual, like once you get outside the meat, once you can step away from that, you know, now, you know, all of the constraints that your physical body uh, impose on you, they potentially fall away. Lots of them do anyway. So uh, like if you want to travel interstellar distances, like that's a problem for human beings today because you got to be in this can for like 200 years or 10,000 years to get to the nearest star, depending on what the technology is that gets you. But, you know, if you can just turn your clock rate down, what, what's 10,000 years? You know, you can just do that and wait it out. Um, so like to me, like that's the that's kind of the craziest, obvious thing, right, is 
is it, you know, it, it opens this pathway for people to be able to, to get to, to get outside. So there's a couple of other ones that I'm running out on a list that uh, some of them we talked about. Um, one of them you talked with Dave Lee about, um, but I get, I get, so I guess the first one is you said like you could slip your, your current substrate. There's kind of this debate whether or not it makes more sense to terraform Mars to be more livable for humans like they mm -hmm. are on earth or like adapt humans or modify or have like, I don't know, just change ourselves to be better mm -hmm. suited for Mars. Which one do you think is more appropriate? Like, I think that changing people for Mars is going to happen way faster than the changing it. The, and the one real, I think, I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but uh, there are technologies that are physically possible that would allow you to terraform Mars really fast. Um, the, it's just, uh, we don't know how fast those things are going to come to fruition. So we could get really surprised and it could be that, you know, in the next 50 years or so hundred years, like we develop significant capacities in the, those technologies. Um, these are like, you know, self-replicating micro machines, kind of the gray goo uh, as a tool or, um, you know, vacuum phase manufacturing tools type stuff where you can build arbitrarily complicated molecules um, completely from scratch to the point where you can build molecule size robots that can self-replicate. And uh, so a relatively small number of those things can have an arbitrarily big impact because they just grow exponentially once you dump them onto a substrate if they can replicate in the environment, right? So these are like micro scale von Neumann machines. So in principle, like, you know, the, you know, that the stuff has been worked out from first principle and it's possible to do that. We know from an information theoretic standpoint, we know from, we know that thermodynamics allows it. We know that chemistry allows it. Uh, we know that you can build these molecules. We just don't know how to do it right now. We know they can exist. So that's a technology like we don't know when we're going to get it. And if we did get it suddenly, then terraforming Mars over a span of, you know, 50 years, it suddenly becomes something that, that becomes possible. But absent that, you know, they're, you know, terraforming Mars in less than, I don't know, a thousand years or something like that is pretty challenging. And it's pretty hard for me to believe that the human race survives and yet doesn't, uh, develop the ability to extend our biological, you know, step outside our biological limits. Like it shouldn't take nearly that long to do that, that kind of thing. And the, the, the deal is Mar Mars is just really big, right? So if you don't use a self-replicating technology of some sort to tackle it, then you have to build all the individual things to modify this planet size mass. And that's just a, an in insane amount of, industri uh, of capacity. It, people have talked about, you know, what if we do, you know, macro scale von Neumann type machines to do that? And that's another possibility. But that, that you know, that's also a pretty, this macro scale von Neumann machines, you know, you, uh, you need to be able to build a robot that you can drop on a planet that can make a semiconductor fabric, <laughs> you know, fab. And uh, like the, there are a lot of core technologies that go into robots right now that are already pretty much down at the molecular scale. Like, you know, five nanometer, and, you know, long before we're doing this, there will be one nanometer ICs, and then there will be 0.1 nanometer ICs. And now you're starting to get, you know, chip feature sizes, which are getting down on the order of a molecule. And the way that we build that kind of stuff right now is just has an incredible amount of overhead, building self-replicating systems that can build semiconductor fabs. It's certainly possible. It's just not going to happen soon. Um, whereas, you know, being able to modify our biology, it, it, whether we do it directly or whether we step outside the biology by, um, you know, interfacing biology to machines and using those machines to extend, extend our capabilities. Um, you know, my guess is like, like the runway on that is more visible. Like that's a 50, hundred year kind of thing. Whereas I don't know if the self-replicating um, semiconductor fabric uh, fab is, is a 50 year thing or not. Might be. I see. Um, okay, so in your conversation with Dave, 
he talked about like what it would be like to watch a movie without a Neuralink and then watch a movie with a Neural or basically like get all of the same feelings that you would have gotten without yeah. watching with the Neuralink, but you just get it downloaded or you just get those feelings streamed to your brain. But you don't have to watch the movie. You, you just, uh, you just, it, so this is a, a little complicated, right? So, um, you know, the, the whole Neo downloading Kung Fu kind of thing. Unfortunately, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> um, because the thing is, um, to get Kung Fu in your biological brain, the neurons in your brain have to rearrange. And there's a learning algorithm that they use to do that. And it takes time and information exchange and feedback, right? So being able to reach inside someone's head and just rearrange all the neurons so they use Kung Fu so they know Kung Fu, like that's not something you interface to the brain. Now, if you have a silicon substrate inside your skull or external to your skull that you use in part to manage your body, well, you can download Kung Fu to the external thing pretty quickly. Like that's a thing we can do with computers is you can just dump a bunch of stuff into their memory and they can reconfigure themselves like really, really fast. Unfortunately, biological neurons, to the extent that the biology itself is doing the learning, that's going to be rate limited by the learning algorithm that your neural tissue uses. So mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's a critical limitation on straightforward implications of what we get from Neuralink. So um, now let's say you wanted to download French, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, reconfiguring the neurons in your head in your language center, or actually it turns out when you learn a second language, it doesn't end up being confined to your language center. It ends up distributed all over your brain. But uh, reconfiguring like whatever spare neural tissue you have that isn't desperately needed for something else right now so that you can load French into it, like there's a learning process. You know, you can go learn French as an adult. You can learn it really well if you spend a lot of time on it. Um, but you've got all these neurons in your head that reconfigure to imprint French onto them, all the rules and that, and, and, you know, um, in your language center, right at the bottom of your language center, the input, you know, you've got sound coming in and then, you know, there's stuff that takes sound and breaks it down, uh, you know, into bits and pieces that get turned into words and all the other concepts that you have. And as you work your way up that stack, there's a point in your language stack where the idea is represented, right? In other words, you start with French, and a sentence is said, and you work your way up the stack. And at some point you get to the concept which is being expressed in this lens. And then you go, you can, you know, that becomes an input to other parts of your brain that like take the idea, manipulate the idea, regurgitate it, form its own idea, maybe and stick that in the language stack, work it all the way down to the motors that move your lips and that kind of stuff so that you can say the thing that you want to say in response. But there is this layer where the concept exists and it is, it's not entirely divorced from French, but it's largely, you know, now it's a concept. It's not bound to that kind of stuff. If you have a neural link that plugs into that layer, right, then the input is a concept and the output is a concept. So if you have that layer and you have an external box that knows French, right, then you can, you know, there's this potential. <laughs> this is complicated, mm -hmm. right? I, it, there are things that you have to do that might not be easy or might not even be possible in order to like to do a simple, you know, implementation of this thing that I'm describing. But this is an approach, right? You plug into the conceptual center. So the outside, so the outside system hears French, converts it into the concept, and then you get the concept. But the thing is, your brain already has the concept layer already because we use it for English. Mm -hmm. So you have a pre-existing structure in there that can understand kind of an arbitrary language once it gets converted to the concept phase. And so, so the way potentially you could get French really fast is to, uh, is to, is to have all of the specifics of the, of, you know, it's essentially skip the non-French part of your brain. You, you know, do that in an external system and then have that system plug into your brain at the point where whether it's French or English or German or Hindi or whatever, doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. The experience of the person using the system is they know French, right? They hear French, they know what it means, right? 
and they want to say French, they can imagine what they want to say, and the external system converts that into French and says it. So like, that's doable. Like we, from a first principle standpoint, that's doable, and it doesn't require much adaptation in the, in the biology. So it's not going to be nearly as rate limited by the learning apparatus. And, and it's more general, right? So this isn't like, because you're getting a concept input directly into the brain, you know, if you decide you want to switch to Russian, you know, you just, the external system flips over to Russian because the interface to the concept la layer is the same. Like once you've developed that interface, then, uh, then you get all the languages, you know, or so, you can skip the language. Like if you, if you have an interface directly to the concept thing, you can also take the concept out. So you can take the concept out of your head and inject that into somebody else's head after it goes through translation layer and stuff like that. Because everybody's concept, you know, hardware is going to be unique to that individual. I, they, they have a common mapping space, but, um, but they're not identical. So you have to do a translation thing, but you could work at the concept level having a conversation with another person. So that's kind of like, that gets to what Tim Urban and Elon talk about where communication and words are lossy. Like if yeah. I have an idea and I have to compress it down into words and then spew it out to you and then you process it and then re, re disassemble it, then we lose so much information. Yeah. And there's, you know, there are other challenges too. The, the, the language is it, it's, highly compressed it is error corrected right like there are all these aspects of language that are designed to compensate for noise in the signal and there's these other feedback channels like you look at someone's lips and that affects your interpretation of the phonemes like if you can see their face you look at their expression you get a sense of like how they're like people respond to what you're saying and that's actually part of the give and take of face-to-face -face conversations then you have a dictionary compression system. Like there's a part of your brain when you're having a conversation with somebody that is like, it has an idea of what they know. And that, help, that helps inform how you want to explain something. Like the way you talk to your mom who doesn't know how to use a computer versus your little brother who knows how to use one really great about a particular topic related to computers might be really different because the dictionary that your brain is using to like figure out what set of concepts it can easily convey and which ones are going to be harder. It's different for different people and for people in different cultures, the, di the dictionary can be really different. Right? So mm -hmm. our language apparatus has to use that dictionary as part of the thing. And the, because if you use a dictionary, it greatly reduces the amount of communication you have to do to convey a concept, right? It's, it's a dictionary lookup of an internal mm. state for your, for the person that you're, that you're interacting with. And it lets you know, like, what's the most compressed way to express a particular thing. So it's a huge advantage. But if you're having a conversation with somebody who you don't know their dictionary, it's a big mm. problem. Now, all of a sudden your language is incredibly sort of cumbersome. Um, the thing is like, one of the things is if you can get to the concept level, you might be able to skip the dictionary. Right. So you can have a meaningful, nuanced conversation with somebody who has nothing in common with you, like no common language, no common cultural expectations. Right. So there's another idea that you had shared with me that um, is like, what if you pair GPT-4 or OpenAI's chat GPT mm -hmm. with a Neuralink, then what, what does that lead to? What implications does that have? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, the, that tech is going to be so good by the time Neuralink is available. The, the, the big limiter there is, so, you know, there's moving a cursor around on the screen, but ideally to get to higher bandwidth and yet plug into a symbol system that human beings already, that we know is present in their head. Because at some point we, when people grow up with Neuralinks embedded in their head, They'll have plenty of time through adolescence and all that kind of stuff to develop really specific neural modules in their brain that are designed to talk to this interface and can be pretty mm -hmm. rich. But when we're Im implanting these things in fully formed adults who want to be able to use it in less than 20 years, um, what you need to do is have the system adapt to structures they already have present so that they can use that. 
So for instance, uh, like I, words are a concept that I have that I can work with right now. We know they're in there someplace, right? And so if you can plug into the part of my brain which can express words, then so, so that essentially you plug a neural link in. And so it, you know, if, I'm, if I sub vocalize a word because I'm gonna say something or I think of a word that I wanna say, I think of a sentence, right? I'm like my brain is making the language. And then at some point, as it works its way down the stack before I say it or write it, um, you know, it's present in, I'm going to call them words, right? Or a set of tokens. You could plug that into a model that understands stuff at that level. And the bandwidth goes way up as soon as you do that, because now instead of moving a cursor lab laboriously across the screen to select one of 64 boxes, I now have 8,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 unique tokens that I can instantaneously sample and feed one right after the other. So that the bandwidth goes up a lot. So if you'd asked, you know, five years ago, well, what would you do with that? You could say, well, I could type a letter really fast, <laughs> right? Or, you know, but one of the things you might not have thought is like, well, you know, I could give really quick instructions to my Optimus robot so fast mm -hmm. that I'm almost not even thinking about it. It's just doing what I want. Well, what do you, what you need for that is a language interface to an Optimus robot. Or, I mean, chat GPT is a pretty interesting, we were talking about, you know, how amazing chat GPT is. The interface is just words, right? So if you can generate words quickly and efficiently and you plug into something like chat GPT, which is, you know, it's an, it's, it's an amazingly capable system for taking natural language and, and using, you know, you know, taking that out into the world, manipulating in really sophisticated ways, and then providing you feedback also in the form of words to respond to your request, right? Like, you know, it's like I was writing, a, I was writing some code with it the other day where I was asking it to write this various NumPy programs for me. And it's amazing, you know, you're just like, oh, I want to write this program and I want it to kind of do this and that and the other thing, boom, you get this block of code. And it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. Like it's so much now. So if that, if that's a direct high bandwidth interface that you can respond to really quickly, like that starts to become really interesting. And, and that's stuff, something that's almost for sure doable. Like, uh, you know, it'll, Neuralink's not at the point right now where you're gonna be able to plug it in and get words out of somebody's brain or inject words into somebody's brain. Uh, but the promise is there. It's very likely to be possible to do something like that it might take a significant, I mean, in the beginning, it'll certainly, there'll be a long learning curve for people who are trying to use that. And as the software gets more sophisticated, there'll be less and less of a learning curve. Um, but, you know, there, like there's this, this potential to have a language kind of interface. Because the thing is, we know language is present in the brain. We know about, we know approximately where it is. So we even know approximately where to put an interface to get access to language in the brain. And we have these AIs we're building that process language and they do amazing stuff with it. So, you know, it seems really obvious to me that, we, <laughs> that you would you would take the language out of the brain and stick it into this language-based AI. One of the ways that I've been thinking about Neuralink uh, for, the, for these longer term aspirations is it's basically like you could you could have all of the internet like the cloud immediately accessible yeah. in your brain. So then like with this whole language thing, like if I'm going to a place that I've never been before, I don't know the local language, let's say I'm going to China and I've never spoken Chinese, then I could like pre-download the Chinese language package and then, and then be able to reference any of the words that I'm thinking in English, like it's just pulling the Google translated version immediately and out and outputting. Does that sound feasible? Is that? Yeah. Is that it, I mean, you don't need Neuralink for, you know, for, for that. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have that without Neuralink. It's a simultaneous, uh, parallel, you know, parallel translation is, is, uh, that's a technology that exists and it's getting better really fast. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, your phone can do it, right? It's, uh, it, pe people, 
it's been demonstrated a bunch of times as the as it gets a bit more refined and a bit easier to use. I think you're going to see that as a universal capability. So yeah, you could do that with Neuralink. Um, the things that I think are more fun to think about are the things that like you can't do them without Neuralink. Now the the thing that I was just describing with Chat GPT, you know, say you know. Uh, or like whatever future version of that technology exists by the time Neuralink for, uh, you know, Neuralink for language centers is, uh, is, a, is a product or is, is, is a technology that's available to people. Uh, that, like you can obviously do that with your phone too, right? Because, you know, you can open chat GPT and use a speech interface to talk to chat GPT and you can get the responses back from the, the interesting thing is like how much tighter that loop could potentially get with, uh, you know, if you have a direct neural interface and the, and the potential is, you know, kind of impressive for, you know, I mean, you could, a, a human being using a voice interface, say, say you wanted to use chat GPT to write a novel and people are doing okay. this already, you know, where they write a novel, they write a paper or something like that. There are tricks to using it. You know, you get the output from it. You decide to make a change. You have a slightly different request and you stick the stuff together. You go through a process of editing and whatnot. But you can, you know, you can generate um, sizable, you know, books in a really short period of time with some level of quality right now. And in the future, you'll be able to do a lot better than that. Right. But if you have to do all of the, in, the back and forth all happens with typing on a keyboard, you know, it, you know, if you wanted to write the great American novel, it's, it might still take you days or something like that of refinement and that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you can get the language in and out, uh, directly via Neuralink, maybe you can write a novel in 10 minutes, <laughs> right? Maybe, mm -hmm. it, maybe it takes an hour. Like that would be, that's kind of an, I'm really impressed, like a, a human being actually writing a novel in the span of an hour, right? Like faster than you can read a novel, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'd be like somebody else could have the, the feelings that they got from reading the novel. Yeah, and that, there's that, that too. That requires that, like there's some really cool things about going higher in the stack. When you asked earlier, I think I digressed away from the whole, the conversation with Dave about, uh, about you know, at what level do you want to receive the movie, right? Do you want to receive the movie by watching it, you know, shall we figure out what the photons are and then stimulate the receptive receptive centers in your visual cortex so you see the movie? Or, you know, because the thing is your visual cortex converts that into a set of perceptions. Now, if we plug into the perceptual parts, maybe we just give you the perceptions directly. So like you feel like you're seeing the movie, like all the concepts are then it's kind of like a dream. Like dreams kind of have this very non-specific thing. Like you know what's going on but nothing really exists until you look at it closely in a dream, right? Because it's happening at kind of a conceptual level inside your, or you can go even higher than that. What's your emotional response? You know, and that, that's actually, that's kind of deeper at that. If you want to really do the emotional response, it might be necessary to go down into the limbic system and stimulate some of that, that stuff directly. I'm not sure. So certainly like if you want to smell food, you have to go down into the limbic center, right? Because your olfactory senses go straight into your animal brain. But uh, yeah, you know, it's reality isn't what we think it is, right? Reality is the set of perceptions that we, there's a bunch of hardware in our brain that takes, uh, it takes what our senses detect from the real world. It builds a set of perceptions and then our experience, our, you know, qual our qualitative uh, experience of reality is inside that illusion, which is being constructed from our senses, right? And so you can plug straight into that and skip the whole lower levels of the IO. So we're, we're kind of limited by our human biological hardware to sense and perceive the world. But in the future, like we could have advanced sensors that are superhuman and we could have senses that we don't currently have and then process those with the Neuralink, right? So like, I think you had mentioned infrared vision and I don't know, like hearing, hearing uh, decibel ranges that we don't currently hear. Yeah, infrasound, ultrasonic. 
Yeah. Are there well, other sounds? Great, I mean, one of the coolest things to be able to hear, like if you wanted to add some, is be able to hear if like have have a software defined radio so that you can just hear radio waves, right? So that you can hear the Bluetooth, you can hear the Wi-Fi, you can you can hear the television channels, you you know, you can hear the Starlink when you're outside walking your hand, you know, like whatever you focus your attention on, you just hear that stuff, right? And how about like perceiving uh, elect or magnetic fields? Sure. Yeah. That, I mean, people have done that one. That that was uh, the um, people have done it a couple of different ways. But there was one that I thought was kind of interesting, where somebody they built a a bracelet. It's actually to go around your ankle, and it had um, it has a set of sixteen little vibration uh, thing. You know, kind of like your, how your iPhone can vibrate or whatever the deal is. So it's got 16 of those arranged equally around it. You strap it on your ankle. And what it does is you get a slow tapping sensation that's aligned with the magnetic field wherever you're at, right? Mm -hmm. So you just, you put this on your ankle and you walk around with it, right? And what happens after a while is your brain starts to integrate its understanding of the magnetic field, uh, you know, where you're at. Like you get in the car, you can sense the magnetic field change or you walk through your house and the, the bracelet, you know, it notices the little electronic devices in the various rooms and that kind of stuff. And so you, you can like you can find your way around the house in the dark, right? Because your little magnetic sensor thing is telling you things about the environment that you can't see normally. So that's a it's an interesting experiment in learning because because your brain is really good at taking almost any kind of input and then integrating it into its worldview and then learning to use it well for its, in this case, it's the sense of presence or, you know, or understanding things about the environment that, that you don't get. But there's a learning process with that, right? So Neuralink will be like that on steroids. Like almost anything that you decide to plug into the brain, which is a new sense, you know, the brain will rapidly get to work figuring out how to make use of that to understand the world better. Sure. There were a lot of things that I, I made this quick little list of uh, stuff that I thought, you know, so what what did we see that was new at this Neuralink show and tell, right? And I was trying to think of what those were. And I so like my biggest takeaway was the manufacturing scale up. Right. And what I wrote down was like, you can tell they're manufacturing scaling. You can tell they mention focus on particular things that you would associate with manufacturing, like scaling up to make a product, like, you know, lifetime testing. They've got these new facilities in the work. You know, they've, they've got a dual operating theater now. And it looks like one of them is cranial and the other is spinal, you know, so they've got both of the, like. Uh, so I thought that was significant. They mentioned building a clinic. Right. Or, you know, they're mm -hmm. building plans for a clinic. So like. Planning for a clinic, that's not something you do if you think, yeah, maybe we'll get to market in 10 years, <laughs> right? Planning mm -hmm. for a clinic is something you do like when you're expecting to move pretty fast. So I was, I had, like, I was impressed. That that stuff left me with a different impression of Neuralink than I had after the first show and tell. So the other, let's see, they walked us through robot upgrades. I thought the custom optical path was an interesting optimization. And that's, so on the on the robot, they need, you know, they need to get visibility down inside this same space in this really small location where they're also got probes going around and they have a couple of different things that they need. They need to be able to, you know, illuminate the tissue in a particular way and they need to be able to take a visual signal back out of it. And they've got this really small space, right? So they develop a custom optical pathway that separates the channels with polarization, right? Mm -hmm that's a lot of optimization, right? Like that's not okay. just fooling around. Like that's a pretty complicated piece of very specialized work to make the robot better, right? So the, the a takeaway that I get from that thing is, is the robot, it's, they have really high expectations for it and it's getting relatively mature and they're throwing, a, a, they're like, it's not the, they're not developing in certain respects, the Neuralink that they're making right now is kind of definitely a Gen 1. And, you know, Gen 3 is going to look really different. And Gen 5 is going to look really different from Gen 3 and so on. Uh, there are points along a path. Um, but the robot, it doesn't, they, it, they didn't do a quick and dirty robot, right? To just like, so they could get the implants basically working, right? They're really thinking about like, what does the ideal robot look like and developing the tech for like, you know, the high volume robot that you're really gonna want when you're 
uh, when you, you know, is like, yeah, I need a certain level of accuracy. I need a certain level of performance. I need a certain cost point that I've, that I've got to get to. Like my impression is that they're, they're thinking about it in those terms. This is not like a research project. This is a, we're scaling up to mass manufacture this thing, which also says like, if they're scaling up to mass manufacture this thing, it's like they have no ser- they have no real doubt that they are going to mass manufacture it. Like they're making those investments right now. Um, the plans for the Transdura implantation, well, that is brilliant. Like that is really good. Like if they can not break the Dura when they put the probes in, that solves mm-hmm. a whole bunch of potential issues. Like it's a big win. So, I, and, and, and it's not easy. So it's going to be interesting to see how they do that. Like how do you, seeing the vasculature through the Dura so that you don't have to break the Dura when you do the implant, when you mm-hmm. put the needles, I mean, putting the needles through the Dura, you know, they're working on coming up with a better needle. It needs to be stronger because the Dura is pretty tough. Uh, they'll figure that out, right? It's not an easy problem. Uh, it, I, I thought it was kind of interesting that they're, that, that, that apparently their approach is to try lots and lots and lots of needle designs uh, mm-hmm. and then see the strengths and weaknesses, uh, you know, that they're uh, of these different approaches before they sort of, you know, dial down to a particular one, which like, that's interesting. Like most people, they sit down and they try to understand why the, why a particular system didn't work. And then they design a slightly different one. Maybe they are doing that and they're just doing it really fast. Um so they talked about 16K channels in the mm-hmm. next, you know, they're going to do another chip that's 4K per chip and a new version of the implant that's four chips, 16 channels. 16 channels is a lot more than a thousand channels. Like that's going to be a really big step. Even 4,000 channels is a lot. Um, so that was another thing that really struck me about what was going on. Um, the fact that they developed brain proxies, I thought was kind of interesting. I, I mean, in, to a certain extent, it makes sense that you would do that, but the amount of effort that they're putting into like developing good brain proxies so that, you know, so that they can do their, you know, they don't, they do less in vivo testing and more in vitro testing, but also like building a brain proxy that has the right sort of kind of like, uh, that's, that's a good proxy for like, te- you know, this whole thing where like you take a needle and you stick a thread in, Mm-hmm. to the tissue. And then you want to pull the needle out and leave the thread in place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so think about the properties of the brain, of brain tissue that affect that at the margin where you've got all these complicated things kind of interacting. There's, there's all of these chemical aspects of the brain, uh, of the tissue and the brain and how it's going to interact with the thread and the needle of, you know, the water, not just the water content, but all of these other uh, chemicals, some of which are electrical, electrochemical, and they're going to interact with these metal things that you're putting in there. Like coming up with a brain proxy that actually mimics all that stuff well enough that you feel like, well, if it works in the brain proxy, it'll work in real Like that seems like a real significant challenge to me. So I was surprised to see them. But, you know, that's also, they said they were committed to trying to not using animals for exploration. And so this you know, to me, I, that it sounds like they're very serious about that because developing a brain proxy is going to be really, really hard. Like it's a big, significant side project. Once you get it sorted out, it's really valuable. I mean, you know, not just because you don't have to use as many animals, but you, I mean, you, you can only use so many animals and using animals, like even if you take the ethical aspects of it off the table, it's really, they're really hard to use. It just takes, you know, uh, it's just a lot of work to use animals to do a lot of this kind of stuff. And by developing a brain proxy, you can, you can do stuff at scale and much more quickly that you don't have to. So like, it, it totally makes sense that they're doing this. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's really impressive that they're doing it now, right? They're, they're not fooling around. They're going to scale. Um, so they had a near term. So I, I had noticed like in the previous uh, animal stuff that we saw and uh, they, they they weren't, doing any stimulation like we didn't see any you know neuralink injecting signals into uh into the brain the body previously and this time we saw we saw them actually they had a spinal implant in a pig and they were demonstrating a certain degree of control over the muscles in the in one of the rear legs that was actually pretty impressive like i had some pretty basic questions about how 
how you were going to be able to like get enough control over motor. I, I think I mentioned this before, but you know, uh, uh, individual muscles in the body, they have a large number of motor, motor units. So an individual motor unit is like a, it's a, it's a collection of muscle fibers that have a common innervation. Like there's a, there's a single neuron that comes down and tells this group of, of fibers to contract and uh, muscles in the body have anywhere between like, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred to several hundred motor units in them you know, your bigger muscles have a lot of motor units, right? So if you want to do a good job of contracting muscles, you, you want to get control of a bunch of different motor units, right? And then the other thing about motor units is like when you fire a motor unit, it, you get it like a hundred millisecond contraction and then it has to rest a minute and then you need another one, right? So your brain actually rotates between the different motor units in a muscle. I'm not actually sure if that occurs in the brain stem or if that occurs um, in the, uh, in the, there's a place where the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron come together in the back of the spine, right? Uh, so I don't know if the processing for that happens down there. I think it doesn't. I think it actually happens in the brain. So, so you know, if you want fine, smooth control of contracting a muscle, which you're going to need if you want to walk, you, you know, you need access to a bunch of motor neurons and you need, you know, you need to develop an algorithm that can use them so they can sequence them appropriately to get the right duration of the right amount of force with the right onset and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you're doing that with a bunch of different muscles, you need a lot of interface to a lot of things. And, and, and the contraction seems kind of complicated. Uh, and yet in the video, it looks like they've got, I mean, I, I suspect they're not getting activation of a lot of motor uh, units when in the pig demonstration that they did right now. And certainly, you know, <laughs> it's in no way coordinated. There's nothing like walking involved. They're just demonstrating that they can activate individual muscles. Um, but they are activating individual muscles and they're getting a sustained activation of the muscle, which I thought was pretty impressive. So they're doing that. They're talking about uh, going into the visual cortex, right? There was a talk there, you know, so they're thinking about it. They have plans to do it. They've done enough looking at the uh, structure of the tissue that they need to interface and examining whether or not they can do that. Uh, you know, and they've done it in a couple of animals, right? Like they've got some animal experiments that basically demonstrate that they, uh, that they're able to stimulate the visual cortex and that the animal will perceive and respond to it as if it were in, uh, you know, a flash of light in its visual field. So that I thought was impressive because we didn't see, to the best of my recollection, they weren't doing any input before, and now they're doing some input. That, that's super important because like the potential for changes in behavior of the, of the tissue, both an immune response and also that the nerve tissue itself will, re, will change its structure and that that will actively interfere with your ability to inject a signal into it is much more likely for outputs than it is for inputs because input is basically passive, right? you're definitely not stimulating any electrochemical response in the tissue. If you just, you have a passive wire that's sitting there, or it's very minimal because it changed the presence of the metal itself will change the electrical field and, and the area. But as far as we know, neurons, they're not super sensitive to local electrical fields, right? Yeah. It takes a pretty big pulse of current to actually trigger a neuron, but the flip side, like that's something you can expect a significant amount of pushback from the tissue of the brain when you start stimulating it. And uh, like, I don't know a lot about, about how that stuff responds, but they've taken the step of doing it and they're getting that learning under their belt. So that is very cool, I thought. Yes. Um, sorry. You have to go. I, no, I don't need to go. That was a, a voice activated system responding to me. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, before we go to the next topic, um, Mm -hmm. Is it possible that they were just so like the way I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if I'm holding this cup up and I just hold it for an hour, then during that whole time, like there are different muscle groups that are being activated and turned on and off. And, and there's many of Even them. Even if you and... hold it for one second, right? Because okay. individual activations are only about a tenth of a second. 
So if you hold it for one second, there's at least 10 different. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's 10 different muscles. Once a muscle fires after it, after it rests for hundred milliseconds, you can come back to it. So like at a minimum to be able to smoothly apply a continuous amount of force, you probably need three different sets of motor units that are giving you approximately the, you know, the same amount of force as you rotate between them, right? So it's not physically possible for like any stimulation to occur at just one specific muscle unit and just continue that one for like three seconds. On some scale it is. Like if you just activate a motor unit and you hold it, what will happen is the motor unit will contract, exhaust, contract, exhaust, right? There'll be, it'll be jiggling at about 50 Hertz or something like that. And in fact, um, you can, uh, you can observe this yourself. Like if you do weightlifting or whatnot, go in, the go in the gym, load up as much weight as you can do, or you can actually, another really easy way to do it is like clench your jaw, put, feel your jaw muscle and then clench it tight. And when you get it really tight, it'll start oscillating. And it's that thing where they're exhausting and releasing and then recontracting. Right. So the thing is, if you need to not have that vibration or not have that vibration be big enough that inner, like if you want fine control, that vibration will mess with you. Right. So if you only have a single motor unit, what's going to happen is the, the muscle, well, first of all, it's going to get, you're, you're not going to get a good power profile. It's going to get really tired, really fast. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's also going to be vibrating. Right. And so like, if you want smooth stuff, what you want to do is you want to smoothly transition between a set of fibers and you want to give them time to recover before you ask them to contract again, to get good control, to get fine control. You, right. So like, you know, if you want, like, they're not going to be able to be, activate one motor unit in the thigh muscle and be able to walk with it. You know, they're going to need a little better control. Okay. <laughs> So okay. now, so an interesting question is to what extent do they need to build into their algorithms, the stuff that your brain is doing when your brain does this with your muscle, like to your brain, your bicep is 200 different muscles that all kind of have the same action. Not quite pretty similar because different parts of your bicep can contract separately. Right. And they do generate slightly different forces and your brain learns all this stuff. It's just, you know, your, your bicep is, is uh, like, it's like 380 co-located muscles with a common insertion and origin points, right? It just looks like mm -hmm. a single muscle when you cut, when you cut it open, but to your brain, it's 400 muscles. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Keep going with the topics that you, I think it looked like you were reading off of a list. Yeah. So I just, I wrote this stuff down to help me remind. So the, they're working on a spinal implant. Okay. Right. That's a really yeah. interesting thing because the, the existing Neuralink, like it's a really good fit for the skull. Like it, it replaces a piece of the cranium, right? Mm -hmm. It's designed to sit in that gap between your skin and the dura. And, you know, the probes are aligned, you know, they come out of the bottom of it. It's designed to, it's got a bottom that faces the brain and a top and the top is where the inductive interface and all that kind of stuff go on. I mean, uh, okay, so now you want to go to the spine. Well, the spine is really different structurally. First of all, it's a really dynamic, your, your brain is more or less a static bone. I mean, it's got joints and they do move around a little, a little bit, but the amount of movement is super small. It's, you know, it's more or less a single structure. Um, but your spine isn't like that at all. And not only is it super flexible, it's load bearing. <laughs> And it's critical to normal function, right? So it moves. It's also got a really complicated shape. Your brain, you know, it's like your cranium, it's a more or less universal thickness if you look at any small subset of it, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. if you get the thickness about right in the neural, you know, the spine's not like that at all. It's got a really complicated shape to it, the, the spine itself. Then you go into the spinal column. And that's also like, as you work your way down the spinal column, like every single vertebrae, it's a different shape, right? And the, you know, the composition is different. As you work your way down, there's less and less white matter, more and more gray matter. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, the gray matter, it's like uh, Neuralink, like maybe they can plug it into white matter, but white matter is the, it's the myelinated axonal sheaths coming out of neurons, right? And you could, and you could trigger that, I suppose, but mostly Neuralink, it's really, you know, it's really clearly designed to plug into gray matter and inner, you know, essentially influence or read what's going on from neurons and gray matter. Well, the gray matter on the spine, spinal cord is on the inside and it's got a pretty complicated distribution of stuff. And, and 
and this is really important, you know, there's, it's kind of, it has this dorsal part, which is the part that's closer to the outer part of your back. Well, that's where all your senses are. The motor control stuff, it all comes from the inside of your spine facing in toward your, you know, so, so if you want to get a probe into, you know, the dorsal, uh, the, the, sorry, the ventral horn, the vent, the in, inside part is the ventral, the outside part is the dorsal. The, mm -hmm. if you want to get to the ventral horn, which is what you need to get to, you have to like, you know, you have to deal with the fact that you're in this highly flexible, dynamic load bearing, you know, you like, you can't just cut off a piece of vertebrae and replace it with a piece of plastic. Right. That like, at least I don't think that's going to work at all. It, it's also really complicated. Like the vertebrae, the back of the vertebrae, they have all these spines that come off and there's this very complicated uh, set of ligaments and muscles that, that, you know, that make it flexible and protect it. Right. And you have to respect the integrity of this complicated structure. When you do that, if you just cut a ligament off of the horn of one of the vertebrae, like the animal is not going to be functional if you do that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, when I thought about them doing the thing in the, in going into the spine, I thought that's cause you can, you can like to a first approximation, you can implant the neural, the neural link relatively close. Like if you have two or three inches of wire that can go to your probe, you know, you can find a space between the disc or you can drill a really small hole maybe in a vertebrae and then feed through that. But then, but now you've got to feed all the way through that, feed all the way through all the white matter. You know, there's a distance you got to go. And then you got to go through the dorsal horn and into the ventral horn, right? And then get your probe placed there. And it's all possible, but it's not like just, I mean, the cranium is so much easier, right? It's just on, on that, uh, you know, it, it's impressive that they seem to be doing it. Right. They, they showed examples of them, you know, placing probes into spinal tissue. And obviously they're doing it. The pig demo shows that they even get functional, uh, functional stuff out of it. So I thought that was a, that's a really impressive result to me. And it's a really big difference from the last show and tell. Uh, so you said that the white matter is my, myelinated myelinated ax axonal sheet. Oh, yeah. Sheet. Yeah, so the axon that comes out of a neuron, like in, in gray matter, when the axon, the output from a neuron that, you know, the neurons, when one neuron talks to another, what happens is the axon of one neuron forms part of a synapse, which is a junction between two things. And then the other side of the synapse is a den the dendritic half of a synapse. So it's the input to a different neuron. An electrical, you know, this electrical domino effect thing propagates down the axon and then to the axonal side of the synapse, the, that synapse, it responds by releasing a chemical across the synapse, a neurotransmitter, right? Mm -hmm. That's where the word comes from. It transmits neural information mm -hmm. from one cell to another. And then that triggers, you know, the, the same sort of cascade function on the other side of the synapse. Okay, so if you wanna send a signal very far, uh, you kind of have this transmission line problem, right? It's a, 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 an, an axon, like if you're just going a short distance, you can just have an, have an axon, but say you want it to go really far. Like there's a, you have a lot of neurons in your brain that are like a meter long. <laughs> like it's a single, the axon on a single neuron is like feet long. And uh, so if you want good signal integrity, the axon needs to be insulated from the surroundings. And so, and this is what, my, there's, a, there's a sheath that nerve mm -hmm. cells can wrap. I think they're called Schwann cells or whatnot. They wrap myelin around the axon. So if you want to send a signal a long way, well, if you have bundles of nerve fibers going from one place to another, these, it, this is what we call white matter. You know, you got a bunch of axons of a bunch of nerves and they've all wrapped in their own little sheaths. They're all traveling together. And it looks like a, you know, when you, if you look at a brain, it's got gray matter, which is like lots of neuron bodies and, and with that, with, with relatively short axons. And then you've got white matter, which is mostly just the axons of nerves traveling a long way, taking a signal, say from the brain to a muscle in your jaw or the, the, uh, you know, the, an upper motor neuron. In fact, <laughs> I think the longest one in your brain, there's a sensory neuron that runs from the tip of your big toe all the way to the base of your all the way to the base of your brain, right? So it's like, you know, 1.5 meters long or something like that. Hmm. 
Okay. Uh, well, so, and then the white matter in the brain is, uh, is, is in, it, it's closer to the inside. Yeah. And the gray matter surrounds that white matter. Yeah. But in the spinal cord, it's reversed. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 uh, your neocortex, which is a huge chunk of your brain, and it's the outer part that we were talking about. It's this sheet. Mm -hmm. The sheet. Well, yeah. the way that the signals travel from one column to another in the brain, if they have to go very far, is they come off the inside and they go because you know you walk you walk it. The short path is through the mm -hmm. brain, right? So if you look at the if it, this this neocortex watered up inside your brain, it has all these nerve fibers on the underside of it that cross connect to other regions of the brain. Like if, if a signal is going a short distance, it can just go laterally across a couple, of, a couple of columns. But if it needs to go very far, it exits the bottom of the column, enters a nerve fiber, and then that signal will hop across to some other, you know, it'll, it'll go across to some other column in the brain. And when a signal needs to leave your brain to go to some part of your body, right? It has to travel through one of these long, you know, isolated myelinated axons. And that will, you know, in the case of your spine, there's a signal that will go, it goes from your brain, it goes down your spine until it gets to the vertebrae where the nerve exits the spine. And then there's a junction there. So you got the upper neuron, the upper neuron is the one that goes from the brain to that point. And the lower neuron is the one that goes from that point and then exits the, the, uh, exits the spine and might go, you know, if it's like a motor unit, it'll go all the way to the muscle fiber and it'll have a, the, the muscle fibers ha have little input things, switches on their surface and the nerve connects to that switch. And so the signal travels down and when it hits the end, then the muscle, the motor unit contracts. And then, okay. And so then they talked about like going the reverse so that you have some sort of feedback and mm -hmm. then, so let's say like I want to stimulate my ankle moving this like like this. Uh and then and then I do that and it hits a fuzzy uh surface. Mm -hmm. Then I get that sensory input and it sends it back through another lower motor neuron from from that so motor problem. neurons are the ones that go out to your muscles so the sens sensory neurons that come back from like you know the touch sensors in your skin or something like that we don't they're not called motor neurons but you know it's a similar oh, thing it sense. runs in the opposite direction okay yeah so so it's it's also getting a lower lower sensory neuron yeah yeah and that's literally what it's called uh maybe yeah okay could be and then sends that back and then uh hits like an on off switch in the the spine area in that same yeah. spine area yeah so the dorsal okay. the dorsal horn of gray matter inside the spine usually there would be an interface there so yeah so the sensory neuron will come in it'll enter the dorsal you know there's a there's like a little tube in the back of the vertebrae that it enters through and then and you know it it uh, it goes into that the dorsal horn which is where the sensory neuron interfaces are and then that switches to another neuron that the um i think are they called rising neurons or descending neurons? i forget but it's a neuron that goes up you know and that uh, sent brings a signal back up to your brain okay and that when that upper neuron hits your brain again that is hitting in the white matter or gray matter well, the white matter is the is the wire, and the gray matter is like the computation, right? Substrate. So, like the the bodies of neurons that do the processing, mm -hmm. you know, that make decisions, that do the switching or whatever the deal is. That's the gray matter, and the white matter is cabling that runs from one part of the body to another. So I your see. spine, you know, if gotcha. you look at the spine, it's got a ton of gray. It's got a ton of white matter because you know the a really big part of his job is just you got this giant bundle of signals and it's got to go down your body, right? So there's all of these axons for these neurons that are just going down the spine. And then, so this is the, that, that the thing is like uh, on your brain, right? The gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. Yeah. The white matter is on the inside because that's the right way to architect it. You know, it's because, 
you know, you don't want to have a wire running around the outside of the brain and you can just go through, right? It's shorter mm -hmm. to go through mm -hmm. the middle, right? When you get to the spine, you know, but you know, it turns out the evolution decided to put the white matter on the outside and the gray matter on the inside. Um, so it's a little bit harder to get to the gray matter in the spine because it's surrounded by thick layers of white matter, uh, which is sensitive. You know, you have to be really careful. You can't just cut holes in white matter because you're cutting the axons. That you, it's a spinal. You're severing the spinal cord, right? If you if you slice into the white matter. But if the white matter, so white matter being external to the gray, gray matter in the spine, that that's actually more inside of our bodies, right? Yeah, well, it's first of all, it's inside the horny protection of the spine itself, right? Because the okay. spinal cord, it runs down a channel in a, the stack of vertebra, ver, vertebra, vertebral bones. Uh, and, uh, so like, you know, you got a bone <laughs> and then you got a bunch of white matter and then outside that, it's not even just that problem. I mean, you have like, you know, ligaments and muscles and connective tissue and then skin, <laughs> you know, outside that, and you have to go through all of that stuff. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, the spine is just this flex. It's this powerful, rugged, flexible, dynamic structure which is really different from the brain, from the skull, right? Which is rigid, mostly. It's approximately rigid, doesn't move much. You don't really, you know, there aren't a lot of muscles on the top of your brain that are that on the top of your skull that are powerfully moving your scalp around, right? But the muscles in your spine, they have to hold your entire body weight. Hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay, so I guess I wanna just make sure I verify my understanding. So. The, the neurons are in the, the gray matter up in the brain. That's like when we the, say well, the neuron bodies, right? I mean, the, the, okay. the neuron itself, it there's a body, which is the cell body. And then it has dendrites that come in and then it has a, one axon typically that come out. And the, the axon, like if a nerve, if a signal has to travel a long way, it's the axon that'll be long. So the nerve body, it'll be at the input near the dendrites. And then you'll have the, this axon that's really long. And then the end of the axon will end in one or more synapses where it connects the dendrite of other neurons. Or in the case of a motor unit, the, the synapse, actually it interfaces to, uh, motor, to a, a bundle of muscle fibers. Right, so the, the white matter is nerve, is neurons. It's just, just the axon part of the neuron but then how is that connected or how is it in close proximity to a dendrite of another neuron if that dendrite is not in the white matter so the it's so the uh well so if you have say the say that you know you have a particular vertebrae you know uh t7 you know <laughs> right okay. here in the middle of your back. And uh, so you gotta, so you, you, you know, processing happens in your brain, in the, in your motor cortex, it decides it wants to contract this muscle. So a neuron somewhere in the cortex, whose job it is to contract this, to make the final decision on contracting this motor unit switches on at the, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the brain and that motor neuron, it has a really long axon on it. And the axon will, will come at it, it'll go through the white matter inside the brain. It'll go down to the top of the spinal cord. It'll keep going. It runs down in this channel, right? It'll keep going down until it gets to T7. And then right at T7, it'll, the, it'll emerge into this ventral horn where there will be a nerve body with, ner with dendrites, right? for the nerve it's going to activate. So now it's going to trigger that nerve. Now that nerve is going to exit the spine, run down, uh, I guess in this case, T7. Well, this would be like a breathing muscle or something if we were at that nerve. But anyway, it goes out to the, you know, your diaphragm or whatever it's activating. And then it will, it, it uh, sent, takes a signal along to a motor unit in that muscle. And then that muscle contracts, right? So you, you've got, you, I mean, you're, you, there's a bunch of tissue in your brain that makes a decision to do this. Then you have a single neuron whose job is to take it from the base of the brain down to the vertebrae and another neuron 
whose nerve body is in, is in that ventral horn of gray matter inside the spine, approximately at T7, which we're talking about. And its axon will leave, you know, it'll exit the vertebrae through a passageway and it'll go all the way to the muscle typically. I see. Okay. So I think, I, I think I'm getting why I was confused because mm -hmm. the axons that, that are in the brain and only in the brain. So, uh, like the, axons they're... that don't go very far aren't white matter because they're not myelinated axons that have to go very far. If they have to take a signal a long way, they need insulation on the wire and the insulation is what makes it white matter. I see. Okay. Uh, in the, in the example that you provided with the diaphragm, is there sensory information, sensory neurons that get sent back up? Uh, let's see. Generally, yeah. For skeletal muscles, that's definitely true. For the for the uh, diaphragm, it, di the diaphragm is an unusual piece of muscle, so it, it might be a little bit different. But like regular skeletal muscles, um, so a skeletal muscle fiber itself, I believe, does not have feedback. But what what does have feedback is that there are sense cells that are in the ligaments. So the a mu muscle doesn't connect a bone directly. There's an intermediate tissue called the ligament that connects to the muscle on one side and to the bone on the other side. Ligaments frequently have uh, sensory cells in them that sense the tension that the ligament is under. So that's a proprioceptive feedback. So there would be a sensor in that, and that thing will send a signal up. You know that that thing will report back to the spinal cord and ultimately back to the brain. And that goes through the dorsal horn uh, and, and then triggers a switch there to then send a different upper sensory neuron up through the white matter again till yeah. reaching. Yeah, so I mean, the axon is the cable part of the neuron and the gray part is the body and the dendrites. Right. I mean, there are also so the, the parts of your brain that just that just make decisions. Like if you 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 look in the neocortex, right? Like a mini column has a hundred neurons in it, and most of those neurons are just talking to other neurons in the mini column or to adjacent mini columns, right? So they have dendrites and axons, and their axons are super short, so they don't need to be insulated, right? But mm -hmm. at the bottom of the mini column or towards the bottom of the mini column, there will be, you know, there may be one or more neurons that that need to send a signal to another mini column far away, or maybe all the way down the body to, uh, to a motor unit somewhere. And, and so, so that part, that the axon of that nerve, when it, when it exits, it'll get routed. And the thing is because these signals tend to, to travel in clusters, right? What you see is a whole lot of different neurons, axons get in a bundle that becomes a nerve fiber and it runs you know, to some part of the body, but it'll be a whole bunch of neurons that are all going to approximately the same place. And so they're, you know, they travel together, um, but they, each one has a separate axon and each of those axons is isolated. And if you get a sufficient bundle of them together, it becomes white matter, right? And it, it's, so it's just the signals that have to go a long way, go white matter. And the signals that are traveling tiny distances, microns, or you know a millimeter inside the brain or something like that. They they they, you don't need white matter for that because the signal's not going so far that it needs to be uh, protected. And I see. Is it true that myelin sheath can form around shorter axon lengths? Uh, I'm well. So the myelin sheath itself is not part of the neuron. Like there's another kind of cell that wraps itself around the uh, around the axon to form the that insulating myelin sheath, and I think those those kinds of cells they're just basically not present in the gray matter parts of your brain, and they are present in the white matter parts. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Keep. Uh, 
if you have more more stuff, please keep keep going. I think now that was. I think I got through the list of just like uh, what. Okay. Okay. So one thing. Uh, the software. Hmm. The. Uh, the software is still super simple, super early days, right? Like my, the scent now, you know, they didn't show us the software and they didn't talk in great detail about how they were doing stuff, but it sounds like they're mostly have pretty simple algorithmic techniques that they're using both to, uh, to extract uh, signals from the brain. And now they did show, they did, they clearly showed some, some very simple neural networks that they were using to process outputs to make decisions about like moving the, 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 the cursor around and that kind of stuff. But this is like, you know, it's a 32 neur, neuron. These are um, neural network neurons, not neurons in the brain, but they'll have like a 32 neuron single hidden layer with like two output neurons or, so, or four output neurons for moving uh, the cursor around, but the, so, you know, they have this incredibly, incredibly simple little neural network. That's basically looking at the firing statistics and then making a decision, you know, on which direction the cursor should move. And they, they, they train up that network, but the complicated part of that network is mostly how do you turn the, the firing statistics into a signal that you feed into the neurons. And I think that's probably a really simple, when I say, there's a lot of potential information and nuance in how you interpret those firing statistics. And it seems like right now they're just using really, really, really simple methods to like get stuff basically working. So, so one of the things I did not see was I didn't see any signs that they were trying to do sophisticated interfaces. And in fact, there was one, there was an audience question at the end. Uh, and I forget, uh, the name of the woman who asked the question, but she basically said, you know, you've got this, you know, dynamic tissue that you're interfacing to that, you know, it changes over all these various time frames, hours, days, months, weeks, whatever. And, you know, how does, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that? And can you take advantage of it? And uh, the, you know, the answer that basically came back was, well, you know, we can reprogram our software, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, I'm not doing good credit to the response on the thing, but they're not, one thing that they do not appear to be doing right now is building systems that dynamically change their own behavior in response to changes that they see. And they they gather a bunch of statistics they train up a very simple neural network to do the thing. They test it to see if it's working, that kind of stuff. And then, you, you know, if it stops working, then you gather more statistics and you retrain it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like long-term what you're, you know, it, that the external system is going to be constantly wanting to learn from, and, and you need to somehow close the loop in order to do that, which is going to be easier with human beings so that, so that you so that you have ways of understanding when your training is starting to drift and mm. and then and then improving the training on the system and, and along that path you'll get to you know after you go down that path a little ways you'll get to a place where effectively the neural networks outside that are interfacing to the tissue and the and the networks of neurons in the biological tissue they'll start to act as a single unit learning from each other okay. and adapting to each other. And they're I, like, they're not doing that right now. I can see why they're not. It, they don't need to do it for any of their short-term goals, but like, it's going to be such an important and powerful capability. Like I would have been encouraged to see, to hear them talking about, you know, what they were thinking along those lines and how they were thinking about approaching that problem. And this, this could well be the kind of thing where, like doing this kind of stuff is going to be much easier when you're in a human subject hmm. because you, you can give pretty abstract instructions to a human or you can ask them to tell you with nuance like what they're experiencing when they have it. So you just got much deeper and richer feedback to the experience of the user with a human being than you have. And it might be that that is the right time to start like saying, how can we get the nervous system 
and the external, you know, sort of simple artificial intelligence technology that we're using to plug into it. How do we get those two to play well together so that they, so that we, we now have a complete learning and adaptive system that learns all the way through from one end to the other? Because nerve tissue can do it. And the outside neural network that plugs into it, it can do it too, right? So getting them to cooperate when they're doing it, closing the feedback loop all the way out through the hardware so that the learning can propagate through that whole system, like that, that's gonna open up the, it's gonna significantly improve the signal to noise ratio <laughs> that you get through your link because the systems will learn to get better at it just like automatically and they'll, they'll automatically compensate for um you know as the behavior of the implant drifts you know the nervous tissue and the external system will automatically compensate for it 